Here. Alderperson Feldy? Here. Alderperson Felicki Paneski? Here. Alderperson Mitchell? Here. Alderperson Perella? Here. Alderperson Salazar? Here. Alderperson Savaglio? Present. Alderperson Bourne? Here. Thank you. There are nine present. Okay. Then we'll start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, do we have anyone for public forum this morning? This, this evening? We do not. Okay. Okay. Uh, start right out with the discussion and Chad. Okay. Thank you, Alderperson Decker and Committee of the Whole. So we're here to uh, pick up the discussion on the affordable housing study. And for those of you that are in board docs, the affordable housing study in a reduced size format is attached to this document. So you should be able to uh, see that document if you care to dig into these uh, slides a little bit deeper as we leave from here. But those that were on the previous, the old council have seen a presentation. We're not doing the same presentation today. We're gonna d dive deeper into the results of the housing, affordable housing study and the next steps and what we believe some of the challenges are um, with this whole kind of concept on affordable housing. So on this chart, some of these, the first six or so slides of this presentation are a recap of what was, that's the findings in the affordable housing study. So those that are um, joining us new, we're gonna try to bring you up to speed in a couple slides to the ones that were on the council before, um, just so you can, you guys are kind of at the level playing field when we move forward. So what we have here is a recap of the findings of the previous study and the age cohort projections by the county. Um, so what you'll see from, he, from this map, from this uh, diagram is that um, the green and the, um, the yellow, well the yellow line is the 35 to 54 age bracket um, from 20, 2010 through 2040. The green is the 65 to 84, so you're seeing a significant increase in that population in the county as we move forward. Um, with the younger generations kind of leveling off or decreasing. When we look at the population, the median household income and the per capita income, um, you can see from the chart on the left that the city of Sheboygan is um, the lowest in the county for uh, median household income at about $48,313 and the per capita income at $24,074. Um, when you compare that across the um, city of Plymouth, Sheboygan Falls, Village of Kohler, and the county, um, you know, we have the uh, lower income households primarily centered in the central city that takes down our overall medium income. When you look at the chart on the right, you can see that the, really the only, um, the, the city of Sheboygan is the only uh, community over that course of 2010 through 2020 that saw a population decline. All of the surrounding areas have seen a population increase. Another indicator to look at is building permits. So this chart shows building permits between 2015 and 2020. The chart on the left shows the single family housing units in blue and the duplex units in orange from 2015 through 2020, what you can see is that we've built very few single family homes, um, primarily due to the fact that we don't have a, land, a lot of land available for subdivisions. Um, we, a few years, 2016, 17, and 20, developed a lot of duplexes. These aren't the typical duplexes that you're thinking of where you have two units side by side. These are duplexes like, um, these would be considered developments like the Portscape Apartments on South Pier or the Kingsbury Apartments. So they develop those as duplexes, even though they're multiple units in one building. It's a way around getting around some requirements within the commercial building code for new houses. So when they take out permits, they took out two family permits. So that's where you see the difference with the duplex versus a typical duplex that you would see with a side-by-side -side unit. When we look at the chart on the right, um, 
this is showing in blue the multiple apartments um, and then the multiple condos. And what you can see is, you know, every year during that five year or so span, there's been a number of new apartments that have come online, particularly in the 2019 and 2020 timeframe. And then we had a slow increase in some additional condo units. So um, prior to that, there wasn't a lot of condo development from the time we came out of the recession in around 2012 until that time and before that even to 2007. The chart on the bottom is a figure from the report that total, shows the total housing units by type for Sheboygan County as a whole. And you can see how aggressive uh, development of housing units in 1990 through 2008 when the recession hit. Um, we slumped off and there's been a little bit of pickup in 2015 and in, uh, to present, but not at anywhere near the levels that um, had been uh, done previously. Another indicator to look at is rental unit vacancy. So the, a typical healthy vacancy rate for rental units is between five and 7%. A vacancy rate around five to 7% provides an appropriate balance between supply and demand and gives enough units to provide choices. You can see where the city of Sheboygan is sitting. This is data as of December 31st, 2020. We're at 3.3%. So even though we keep hearing we've overbuilt apartments and we've overbuilt housing, we're nowhere near where we need to be to be in a healthy vacancy level to give uh, opportunity within the market. And we'll talk about that more as we move forward because we're hearing that from our employers that are saying that if, if they can't start filling positions in having housing, they're gonna be looking other places to invest their uh, expansion dollars. So we want to continue to stay competitive on that front. When we look at the demand projections out of the study, so the uh, chart on the left, the rental units, um, is, is your typical rental unit. It could be affordable, it could be market rate, but it, the projection is a 401 units to 1,023 units by 2030. Um, that's around 40 to 100 units per year. You can see the breakdown in the chart of the different rents based and the different units that are reflective of that. Under the owner-occupied um, units, it's uh, owner-occupied housing particularly, 325 to 715 units by 2030 or 30 to 72 new units per year. Um, and this is ranging in a value from around 129,000 up to 234,000. When we look on the right side of the chart, this is really focusing on senior housing. And one of the findings that came out in the study is the fact that we have built very little senior housing. So housing dedicated for people 55 and older. Um, the top one, the senior independent living, um, 1,005 subsidized units and 284 market rate units. The asterisks represent the fact that there is really no count on what the current numbers of senior housing units independent living units are in the city, so there was no way of factoring in existing. So this is projecting basically new of what's required. And then senior assisted living units, 196 by 2030. So between the senior and the rental and the owner occupied, you can see that there's a significant need for a lot more units. So this chart is showing you the gross domestic product versus the residential development that has happened to date. So the blue line is the city of Sheboygan's gross domestic product starting in 2008 through 2019 in comparison to the city of Fond du Lac. So we just wanted to have an indicator of the way the economy has been going and the gross domestic product is a good way of doing that. Um, however, you can see in the city of Sheboygan, it's been significantly more aggressive than the city of Fond du Lac. We chose the city of Fond du Lac because their population and demographics are very similar to uh, the city of Sheboygan. And when you look at the different um, colors on the chart on the left, you can see that the affordable is represented by 401 units. Um, and that would be the Badger State Lofts, the Oscar project, which is under construction today and the Washington School Apartments. The market rate equates to about 495 units, and then condominium units equates to about 36 units. So when you look at the, the chart in the last 
um, five to six years, almost $162 million of new housing has been developed, with, and that, that equated to about 950 um, units. When we look, and I'm not gonna go through each of the individual properties, but overall, the majority of them are 100% full. Um, the couple of most recent ones that opened, Badger State Lofts, which is the former tannery, is about 60% full. Um, Oscar, as I mentioned, is under construction. Kingsbury Village is about 70% full. Um, South Pier Riverfront Condos is 98%. They have one unit, I think, left to sell. Um, the Lux out on Kohler Memorial Drive is at 90%, and the Waters Edge Condominium Complex is about 50%. So the rest of them are running at, the rest of the housing developments are all running at 100% occupancy. Um, so when you look at the numbers, you know, the, the city has been very aggressive and we've been very aggressive in building a mix of housing units, both affordable and market rates. So, um, you know, the, the Oscar project coming on board will be the city's largest at 240 units with a value of about $47 million. Um, but there's definitely demand in the market to fill those units and then additional units from there. So we hear a lot about the fact that we need more units in the range of four to five to $600. And this chart is showing you the fair market rental rates of Sheboygan from 1983 through 2001. And the fair market rental rates is a, is a thing that the federal government uses when they're going to establish uh, fair market rents for programs that they federally fund like the Housing Choice Voucher Program and the Section 8 Funding Program. So these numbers are based on uh, a two-bedroom standard unit, no luxuries. In 1983, it was $283 per month, and in 2021, it's $769 per month. So when we hear from people saying, well, we need more units in the four to 500 range, which we'll talk about shortly, the challenge with current construction costs and what that uh, is gonna do to the cost of building these. But when we talk about the four to $500 range, we're looking at rents that were in that range in 1993, which is 30 years ago. So, you know, so it's, when you say we need those low rent rates, you know, the, those rent rates are, are quite dated from the time when we were at the three, four, five, six hundred dollar uh, mark. So in the study, the study um, lays out a number of funding mechanisms um, to, to deal with this. And we're going to talk more about that today because there's some decisions that the council is going to have to make moving forward. Um, the first one is the expanse, uh, expanded use of the city's neighborhood revitalization fund. That was a fund that was established last year to um, capture one year of revenue from TID 11, which was the Washington Square TID when it closed. Um, state law allows us to keep it open for one additional year and capture whatever increment in there for affordable housing. So that gave us about $764,000, give or take. Uh, facilitate the development of a workforce housing fund. We'll talk about that shortly. Utilize TIF for affordable housing incentives. Utilize TIF the one-year extension, which I just talked about, we did do that with the TID 11. Promote the use of federal and state low-income uh, housing tax credit programs. We'll talk about that. Increase the use of WIDA 710 flex spending. Increase the use of down payment assistance and co-author a bill that offers rental incentives. So I think where this is going is, you know, we have a couple tools in our toolbox for facilitating affordable housing developments and trying to fill gaps in performance. The biggest one is TIF incentives. The second biggest one is giving land away for a dollar to help keep the cost down um, or a nominal fee. And the third one is really the low income tax credit programs, but those are super competitive across the state. And WEDA, W-H-E-D-A is the, is the entity that um, administers those and ranks those applications and um, it's a very hard process to try to get funding through those programs. So the, pro the study recommended a number of recommendations. The first in capacity building and communication was one, establishing a housing committee, providing housing for all 
networking at LIDA events and continue the developer summit to encourage development. The items in this chart that have the red box around, we're gonna talk more in detail of because I believe, and, and Todd and I believe that this is stuff that can, we can work on that we're not already doing um, and, and that it gives us some concrete projects to work towards. Under the initiatives, assist and grow neighborhood associations, purchase and market city-owned redevelopment properties, develop neighborhood master plans, and create a tenant resource center. And then under regulations, allow multifamily units as permitted use, uh, reduce setbacks, create a new residential district, continue the code enforcement program, and continue flexibility on infrastructure requirements. And then lastly, under partnerships, support the Habitat for Humanity, Partners for Community Development, and other housing affordable housing providers, um, which most of you know we do <coughs> give money towards their operations <coughs> under the block grant program. Continue the landlord education training program, form working groups with major employers, and explore opportunities to offer on-site child care and health care facilities. So when we look into the deeper dive into the study recommendations, the first um, recommendation is the establishment of a housing committee. Um, the, there's a number of uh, communities that have them. We've asked the consultant to give us four of their best um, recommendations for this. So they gave us Madison, Eau Claire, Fitchburg, and Middleton. Um, Obviously, Madison has a population of 250,000. Eau Claire has a population of 68,000. Fitchburg has a population of 30,000, roughly. And Middleton has a population of 20,000. We sent emails out to their respective, um, count, my respective counterparts in those uh, communities, and we got responses back from Madison and Eau Claire. We did not receive anything from Fitchburg or Middleton. But what Eau Claire said is they have a housing opportunities commission. It's only been in existence for one year. When we talked to the associate planner, they recommended it may not be worth having a housing committee as there are barriers to education, difficulties in meeting, time dedicated to preparing for the monthly meetings and time dedicated uh, to preparing for working group meetings and facilitating those meetings and it slows down the development considerably. Um, the city of Madison, Todd and I both had a conversation with them and they've had a housing strategy committee in existence for about seven years. Um, they, it's taken them a number of years to understand what their role is. They were originally established to provide a biannual report of housing choices to the common council and they've recently been implementing fair housing issues. The other two communities, Fitchburg and Middleton, did not respond, although on their websites they have a housing advisory committee in Fitchburg that's used to study, research, and recommend policies to the council to promote affordable home ownership and rental housing. And Middleton has a workforce housing committee, but it looks to be very focused on CDBG funding and allocating CDBG dollars. So one of the recommendations and one of the further discussion of the Committee of the Whole, I think, is whether there's interest in developing a, another city committee that would be focused on housing. So option one um, would be the Common Council creates a new housing committee and gives a very specific focus so that we don't kind of fall into the tracks of what other communities have had. An option two would be to leverage and partner with the existing Sheboygan Housing Coalition. This is a group of roughly, mm, probably 30 some organizations that are meet monthly, I think, and talk about housing issues within the community. Um, one idea would be to establish a subcommittee that includes affordable housing developers, realtors, and lenders that can discuss the challenges to overcome. They could report back to the larger coalition and the city and kind of be a nonprofit kind of group that focuses on housing. So um, I think either one of these options is, you know, has potential. We, we wanna just make sure that we don't lose track of the expertise on the housing coalition and that they're, you know, hopefully would be interested in kind of expanding what they're doing to really give them a real focus. Or the option three would be to do nothing. So addressing funding challenges. I talked a lot about what it takes to build housing, but 
really the study finding that's the most, I think, important out of all of them is to build one unit of affordable housing at a break-even amount is about $1,300 per month for a one-bedroom. So if people are requesting rents of five, six, seven hundred dollars per month, um, you can see that that generates a significant gap in the performa per month that needs to be overcome through some other funding mechanism to move this forward. So you know it, it's a ch it's a challenge, and you know people comment about giving incentives towards these deals, giving away land for free, but those are all tactics that are there to try to close that gap behind. What is the market really willing to pay for these units? And you know, what is it costing to build these units? And what I will say is that the $1,300 per month does not take into the current construction costs of lumber um, that's out there as well. So that number is probably higher now than $1,300 when a two by four is a dollar a foot and then some. So, um, you know, the, so those are the challenge to look at. So the question is, is how do you fill that gap? A number of projects have taken advantage of Section 42, the Low Income Tax Credit Fund. It's very competitive. Um, there's got to be a discussion about continuing to provide TIF dollars. The, estab the enhancement of the city's Neighborhood Revitalization Fund, which we'll talk about in the next slide, and then provide vacant city-owned land by selling properties at a dollar or nominal fees as an incentive towards the project. The challenge there is that right now the city has very limited stock on municipally owned sites that are developable for these types of developments, particularly on the size of them and the location. Another study recommendation is the enhancement of the Neighborhood Revitalization Fund. And Todd and I had the opportunity to talk to the city of Madison and they were in the same boat where we are today where they knew that affordable housing uh, was a need in their community um, so five years ago, they, they looked to establish an alternative funding source versus relying on the Section 42 competitive program. So Madison yearly budgets funding towards an affordable housing fund to provide developer incentives to projects. The current Madison fund has over 5.5 million. Um, Sheboygan's current fund balance is about 500,000. Um, and the recommendation at Todd asked them is, you know, what would they recommend the city consider? And they recommended that the city cons budgeted funds to have a separate fund that could provide incentives versus relying on the Section 42 Low Income Tax Credit Fund. Um, and then use those funds to bridge gaps within the project performa. Another study recommendation is to purchase and market redevelopment sites. As I stated before, we have a very limited amount of city-owned properties. So we're exploring the purchase of vacant properties in the city boundaries that are privately held that could be used for single family or multifamily um, and be able to provide them at a nominal fee. But you also have to understand we're going to have to get some funding through the general fund to purchase properties or um, you know, to either purchase and demolish or purchase just outright land to do so because we have been very aggressive in previous developments and a lot of the additional, uh, some, a lot of the previous development that has happened has all happened on city-owned properties. So our inventory of city-owned properties is very small. And the last recommendation is this forming a working group with employers. So we were on a call last week with the um, Alliant Energy Advisory Group. And one of the comments that um, the president of Johnsonville Sausage said was that if we don't take an aggressive approach on getting more affordable and housing in general in this county, that employers like them are going to be forced to invest outside areas. So uh, Todd will talk a little bit about the um, you know, and the job numbers that are out there and what it's going to take to get these employers to expand here. But one thing that Dane County has done is they've developed this Dane Workforce Housing Investors Fund, which is made up of 14 investors that have committed almost $12 million to the fund. Um, and it's used strictly for Dane County's municipalities and communities as a incentive to bridge gaps within their housing, um, you know, their housing developments. 
So the recommendation is to partner with the SCEDC to work with large major, uh, local major employers to address this and develop some type of housing and recruitment fund at the county level that would allow um, municipalities and or developers another source of funding. So that's it in a nutshell. I know that Alder uh, City Administrator Wolf, sorry, um, would like to say a few words as well. Thank you, Chad. Chad, could you please go back to the slide that says review the current residential development? Oh, there you go, right, oh, yep, right there. Thank you. I just wanted to kind of point out a few things to the, to the council and, and those listening. Um, first off, I, I wanna say that we should all be congratulating the city of Sheboygan. When you think of where we were back in 2008 to where we are today, and on this slide, Chad and I chose to go back to 2008 for a, for a specific reason. Back in 2008, the, the county, um, the city and the county did a young professional development team that they reached out to all of the young professionals within uh, the area companies within the city, uh, within the Sheboygan County. The reason I picked that out specifically is because I was one of them back in the day, back in 2008, yes, Marcus, back in 2008, I was considered a young professional. <laughs> what I want everybody to remember is that we also in 2008 went into a recession. So here we are, businesses, local businesses, trying to figure out what's holding us back and how do we get out of the hole that we're in. So if you think about it and you look at it, and again, using F Fond du Lac as a, as a baseline, you can see that the, the blue line dipped a little bit, but then it, it continued to climb. And what's really interesting is when you start looking at, you know, 2015 to today, we have a considerable amount of development. Um, when the Oscar comes online, we're gonna have, you know, upwards of a, close to a thousand um, apartments for our, for our residents. Now, when we think about that, that's just unheard of. But it's not. When you saw the slide earlier, where in the 90s that we were actually had a, a huge boom when it came to a, apartments. We've actually f filled almost every slot within the categories to choose from when you look at A through L. Yeah, A through L. And that's $161 million, almost $162 million of development. Um, so anyway, I wanted to congratulate everybody, but I also wanted to talk about some of the issues that we have. We as a city continue to look at development, and when we outline development, we think of what? We think of businesses, we think of manufacturing, we think of bringing jobs to the community. But back in 2008, it was identified even back then that we needed people, we needed, we needed more employees in our community. Since 2008, and I'm willing to say this, we've continued to have 2,400 plus job openings year over year pre-pandemic that were available. And what do I mean by that? That means that 2,400 people could come up to Sheboygan and get a job and walk in and start working. We've had a deficit of employees for many, 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 and as Marcus would say, decades, Todd? Yes, decades. We've had a deficit. So when we talk about development and bringing new business to Sheboygan, we have a bigger problem where we need to continue to maintain and grow our existing businesses. And we continue to hear about that year over year. And as one of the members of the SCEDC for the city of Sheboygan, even on the executive team, as, as uh, Chad had pointed out, it was again voiced by multiple owners of companies in our community that they need more employees in our community so that they can not just grow but maintain what they have. Pandemic has caused a lot of employees to not be working right now. I know we're in the middle of the pandemic and we will get out of it, but the thing is we need to, as a community, look at the development of apartments and housing just like we do manufacturing. What's the difference? When the city looks at development, we look at it as a tax base, bringing in revenue to the community, right? But we also look at manufacturing 
the same way, but we also look at manufacturing that it's going to bring in tax base. It's also going to bring in revenue through different um, sources of, of, of income. It's also going to bring employees to the community that are gonna buy homes if they have them. And they're also going to rent apartments if we have them. They're also gonna to go to the shops and spend money throughout the community. The problem is, is we talk about what comes first, the chicken or the egg. We've already have the, the actual businesses that continue to, to complain that we don't have the employees. Now we're continuing to talk about housing and we need more of it. I get it that some people don't realize that we are actually doing what we said we were gonna do from 2008 and we're doing a good job of it. But with the economy the way it is, even before the, the pandemic, we need to look at, in my opinion, in my recommendation to the council, is that we look at development like we do, but with in regards to actual housing. And when, we, when Chad and I talked with um, Madison, that's what they do. They actually have funds built up to actually incentivize. So when we look at development of a manufacturer and we, we get nervous about giving them land so they'll build here, multiple, multiple opportunities that Chad and I have had are looking at communities, and Sheboygan's one of them, a great place to work, live, work, and play, but they're like, what's your unemployment rate like? Because if I can't find employees in Sheboygan County, I'm not gonna build in Sheboygan County. It's the same problem in other communities, and we have so much to offer. So my, my recommendation is that, you know, when we talk about a housing committee, that we really should not recreate the wheel, that let's, let's work closer with the housing coalition, let's work with the SCEDC because we're members, Let's find out what the businesses are asking for, right from the horse's mouth. Let's find out how many employees do they need? What are, we, what are they in need of? Because if we lose some of our, our anchors, our businesses that have been here for generations, if they can't compete and be effective, we're gonna lose what we already have versus trying to develop what we, what we want. We also need to look at it, how can we incentivize? And that might be through land acquisition, it may be through some TIDs, it might be th through developing some funds, but if we think about it, if we can get people to move here and afford to live here, because we, uh, living in Sheboygan is affordable, we just need to help them get the housing that they need so that they'll move here and stay here and realize what a great place it is to live, work, and play. So that's what I wanted to add to the council, to the committee uh, for discussion. Thank you. Okay, do you want to start out with the discussion here? Frank? Uh, I, just, I just want to add a few more comments to, um, and I appreciate Chad and, and Todd what they've said too, but I, I, I do just want to underline a major point that, that Chad made too, in, in terms of when we're talking about housing, is that you know what we're hearing from a lot of these business owners is that they want to grow and expand, they want to stay in this community, but they're not able to grow if we're, if we're not able to grow our housing stock as well and diversify our housing stock. You know, a lot of the context that I've been talking about, you know, there are companies that you know say if they want to add a hundred more employees. That's basically a kind of target number of how many more housing units that we need to develop in this community for them to grow and be successful. So I always wanna kind of put that in, in, in context too, but also it's about them relocating, possibly starting their family here. So we're not just talking about one person per job that's brought here, we're talking about maybe four or five, depending on their size of their family as well, for that additional uh, number of folks that, 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 that bring here. And now, I just really want to really emphasize the, the importance of, of this discussion and this topic as well. Um, last Monday, the governor uh, was in town um, visiting um, the housing, uh, housing authority at the Washman building, and along, uh, along with him was the executive director of WIDA. We had a great conversation with other community stakeholders. Um, Rep Representative Katzmo was there, County Administrator Adam Payne was there, um, 
and, 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 and we had some really good conversations about just overall housing in this community and what it means to be affordable and what resources and partnerships the state has. Um, and I'll, I'll say, you know, we, WIDA is very excited about this study. They want to play a partnership in there. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the partnerships that we can have with this as well. And, and, and Todd and I were on a meeting with some folks from the county leadership as well. So in terms of when we talk about this being a, a, a city strategy that we're implementing too, we need to look at it from a regional approach with what the benefit looks like for the entire community and the entire county. Um, so we're gonna be having some more additional conversations on that too. Um, and when, when you're in communication with, with your constituents, because we hear it all the time, you know, we're, we're building too many apartments, we're building too many expensive apartments. We need to really have the conversation to hit home that you know, we're, we're really trying to keep pace with, with, with the demand for the community. Um, you know, if, if you look at the overall population growth of the city, it's declined. But if you, again, if you look at the percentage growth of, of the county, it's 1.4% over the last decade is very stagnant and below a lot of the other growth rates across, across the state of Wisconsin. So we're, we're flatlining here. And when, in order for us to stay competitive and grow, we need to focus on, on our, our, our different housing options as well. Um, so please read the study, please. I know it's, it's, it's a big long read, but if you can't sleep at night, take some time, digest the information. Um, it's, it's, for me, it's exciting stuff um, and gives us a lot of good ideas too. Regarding the housing committee, what we're really looking for is, is, is thoughts and ideas from the council to provide us with a sense of direction. Um, because if you look at the options, you can go all over the place. And when you're talking about housing specifically, there's a lot of, I mean, you can go in a million different ways in terms of, of what, what we're gonna prioritize first. And it's the council's role and responsibility to kind of set that direction for us to get, get a good head start. I know there's a lot of folks in the community that are excited about starting a housing, affordable housing committee and wanna be a part of that conversations and those decisions that are being made. Um, but, you know, as, as we all know, um, when it comes to affordable housing, there's, there's many different directions that we can look at and address. So I just kind of wanted to add, that, add those and thank Chad and his department for putting this together. Alderman Decker, Alderman Bourne. <clears throat> Go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I heard an interesting uh, statistic today uh, and it piggybacks on something that Chad was talking about about the uh, being afford afford to build a, a single family home, I heard that uh, uh, the cost of building a single family home because of the lumber the lumber uh, uh, expenses right now, depending on the size of the si si uh, single family home, can add an additional thirty thousand dollars to a home that's currently being built around the country. Another another thing I another thing I wanted to mention is that. Uh, Another thing we have to look at what's what's the uh, income level for the for the citizens of Sheboygan, uh, lowest in the county. We lost over 900 people in 10 years. What's the reason for that? Uh, we have uh, some of our young people, our millennial age group people, the highest level in the history of this country of those that age group still living at home with their parents. Uh, so I, I think I think our companies. Uh, have to look at providing family supporting jobs. I mean, other than a couple of our largest employers, people in these younger age groups have to work two or three jobs and you can still see what, their, what the per capita income is. Uh, it, it's, it, it is unaffordable to rent some of the apartments that are being built. There's no question about that. But on the other hand, they have other expenses besides their, their rent and uh, and, and the other thing we have to look at, I don't know if you have any statistics, Chad, on what, what the break even it is for a developer for a two bedroom apartment. There's a lot of people, uh, families are gonna be looking for more than a one bedroom apartment. And if the break even, uh, the break even point for rent is 1300 bucks, I can just imagine what it is for, uh, for, a, two, for a, a two bedroom or more. So I, I see one of the big problems just basically is that people in Sheboygan are not making family sustaining wages. And that is a real problem. Uh, you can't expect people to work two or three hours a, a day to put a roof over their head. Uh, I think some of the companies have to take a look at providing higher wages for their employers. And I think that would help the situation. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
who was next? Was it Roberta or Marcus first? Mar Mar Marcus, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got a couple of questions uh, for Chad. Uh, there's about 300 units being added by the OSCAR, 240 to be precise. What are we expecting that to do to the vacancy rate uh, in the short run and long run? The 3.3% the vacancy rate that I showed includes the OSCAR. Oh, my. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And then um, why did the study not uh, include the independent senior living facility numbers that are already in existence in the city? What the consultant told me is that they were unable to find the actual units, the amount of units that are out there, that there's no like state database for independent units to get an accurate count. Did, how much did we pay for this study? <laughs> 30,000. And, and for $30,000, they couldn't be bothered to make a couple of phone calls and a Google search? I, I've done that Google search myself, and I can't find, I mean, there's lists, but you don't know how accurate the information is. And if you're going to put it in the study and you are sorting some you, you know, website that you don't know if it's accurate, it's hard to do that. And a consultant doesn't, typically they like to work with things like the Department of Administration and other organizations. And we had, they worked with a person that's on the MLS, a local realtor, um, to try to pull information as best as they can. We worked with the city at Sessor's office and, and tried to get what we can, but it, it was, the information just wasn't there. Thank you. Uh, my final question would be about the Sheboygan Housing Coalition. I'm not familiar with that, and I couldn't find very much on them online. Uh, do they meet regularly, and how do you get information about them? So Mayor Sorensen actually chaired it for a little bit, so you might have the best knowledge. Yeah, so, I, uh, so the, it's, 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 it's a nice group. Um, they're a ragtag kind of group made up of nonprofits, landlords, other uh, types of housing advocates as well. Um, they, they, I mean, before COVID, you know, they, they met monthly um, and they kind of would address multitude of different issues, homelessness, supporting vulnerable populations, development. Um, again, you know, when you talk about housing, there's a million different avenues that, that come up. And this was primarily the group that had those conversations. And one of their key components was, um, education and, and getting the community involved and talking about, you know, our, our, our housing needs as a community. Um, but again, when you have a, a large group of about, you know, 30, 36 individuals, when everyone has their own kind of, you know, field and realm that they're working in, everyone brings a different priority. So it's not necessarily a focused group and also, and, and they'll, they'll be the first ones to admit it. You know, they, they don't have focus. They don't really have a mission statement or goals that they're working towards. Um, I know when I was the chairman of that committee, that was something we were working on developing. Um, but yeah, that's, that's them. They have a Facebook page. Um, but you know, besides that, I, I don't know what else. Thank you. Okay. Alrighty. Was it Barbara or Roberta next? Okay. You Thank you. Um, I, I was pleased to hear that the governor was in town along with WIDA. Keep that going. That's really very nice. And don't forget that our governor grew up in this Plymouth. So he, he grew up in Sheboygan County. He ought to have a soft spot for us. Um, I am also a believer in not reinventing the wheel. And we have plenty of wheels on the ground right now. So um, sticking close to WIDA, and we also have a couple of very influential state legislators who can help. Second, the SCEDC can bring a collaborative effort to the party, and they can also bring some of their dollars to the party if this is indeed an employer issue also. They might be able to be put in charge of get the employers together and figure out what they can do. Um, third, the Sheboygan Housing Coalition, which we just heard about. 36 people is a lot to herd. So perhaps having them self-select and, and making sure that it is a, a slice of 
everyone that needs to be represented, but they've, they've been talking about housing, so don't disregard that they've already got a background in it. And also, last but not least, don't forget the voice of the people who actually need to, to be in that affordable housing group. So I think, I think we need to move forward. I think this, this uh, research that has been done is, is pretty significant. I also think it's very timely. I don't think we ought to daddle about it all and just move forward. Thank you. Barb and then Grazia. Um, I kind of want to echo what um, Jim had said about um, the income levels and people working two and three jobs and um, just to, you know, keep their head above water. And I, I realize the developers, you know, have to break even at a point, so they can't give their apartments away. But then on the other hand, um, being a board member on the United Way for many years, you know, I, we hear the nonprofits and they are the people working with the, the low income. And I, I would like to see some data coming from um, those groups and find out how they're feeling about it because I think they've got more of a grasp on it. I, I don't see that you're comparing apples to apples when you're talking to Madison. They're a lot more progressive than we are. Um, they've got a lot of well-paying jobs in that area. Um, the, one of their biggest employers, you know, is Epic. Um, but they also have a very large turnover. They also have um, a lot of apartment buildings. If you go through the Fitchburg area, um, there, there are loads of apartment buildings, and many of them, and they are renting them out at $1,000. Uh, I have a grandson that lives in um, west part of Madison, um, off the Beltline, and he's paying $1,000 a month for, for a one-bedroom studio apartment, more or less. Um, so you don't get a lot of space for $1,000 a month there. Um, where here you could probably rent a pretty decent um, home for less than that. So, you know, it's, it's not apples to apples. So, and that's what the people out in the community are going to say. I've said my piece. Okay. Okay. It, it, if I can just, and, and I, we totally understand that. I think what we were looking at more than anything was, you know, Madison has some, you know, major local employers like Sheboygan County does. And, you know, and maybe we're not going to have a fund of five and a half million dollars like Madison has. But at the same token, Madison saw a similar need and said, you know what, we can't just sit back and not do anything. So we need to start putting our own, you know, money and building our own funds. So I think to uh, City Administrator Wolf's comments, it's really about trying to be proactive in what we're doing and, you know, and looking at, you know, if we want to keep these employers here and we want to keep growing and, you know, moving forward that we're going to have to do something out of the norm to move this forward. And, you know, Madison saw that and they did it. So they're, they're the model, but not a lot of other communities have done that. They're, you know, a lot of them are just having, starting to have these discussions and trying to understand how they're going to, you know, fill those funding gaps as well. So, you know, one of the things I didn't say is there's, you know, there, this, there's a place for the state and federal government in this thing as well. I mean, if this is an, you know, an, a nationwide issue on affordable housing. It's just not specific to the state of Wisconsin. So, you know, we need our federal and state partners at the table with us. And um, when we rolled out this plan, we had a community uh, Zoom meeting and there was two federal legislators on the call to get information. So I think if nothing else, the awareness is getting out there and people are starting to, um, you know, see the need. Don. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to kind of expand a little bit more on, on the discussion is when Chad and I were making phone calls trying to, trying to talk to different groups and different committees, it was because we know that there's a, a need. The problem that we have is that we need to figure out 
um, you know, now that we've done a study and we realize where we are and that we still are on this journey, it's really to find out from the, from the city council, do you guys feel the same passion that we're hearing from our, from our business owners and our developers that they want to come to the city of Sheboygan, but we need more housing and with more housing, we will have more employees and with more employees, it means more development opportunities and it also means that we can manage and maintain and grow our present stock of manufacturing. So I think we've heard it long enough and we know that we want, we as a, as a city want development, but I guess it really comes down to, are we willing to look at development from a, not just a manufacturing perspective, but also a uh, increase in the stock of our housing and I think that's really what Chad and I are bringing to the committee is we would recommend that the city council, the city council leadership looks at development, but not just in a manufacturing perspective, but also a housing perspective. Both of them generate um, benefits for the community, not just in, in the tax base, but also opportunity. And as Mayor Sorensen had brought up, we need to remember that it's not just one employee, it's a family. So you're gonna bring more people to the schools, more people to our, our businesses, and uh, you know, start changing the tide of or reducing our, our population to increasing our population so that more people can enjoy what we already do. Thank you. Uh, Alder Perella. Yes, so uh, first of all, I want to uh, confirm that I agree to look at the, at the issue as a housing and manufacturing together. Uh, so I, I agree with the approaches and I also agree, however, with what um, other person uh, Boren said about the fact that uh, we all know that, you know, what is not affordable is not affordable. So the problem is funding the gaps. And my question about that is, did we, um, I agree that a com one more committee, I don't think it would help much. I don't think it would be much of value added to the solution. Uh, what I would be interested, very much interested in is how can we um, be, develop a different relationship with employers or better, the question is what is the, current relationship of the city and employers. How are city and employer, local big employers collaborating or an issue if there is any venue that right now is used for that? So is there a way, is there a conversation, active conversation right now of the city of Sheboygan with the local big um, employers? And if there is none or there is not an actual active conversation that is something that I think it would have a lot of value added. One, to show that we want to be, as a city, that we want to be aggressive with this issue and that we recognize the need of the private employers um, for, uh, for housing. And two, because I think that in that, perhaps there is some solution for uh, gaps funding. I mean, through, through local employers. So the, the idea that Madison has implemented, I think it's a great idea, but we have to have, I, I'm wondering if there is already that channel and if there is none, what can we do to have that channel as an active, continuous, aggressive channel? So just to answer that, so you know, we depend a lot on the Economic Development Corporation to be in that kind of guide between the major employers and the city, and we have weekly calls with them, and the mayor and Todd sit on the uh, executive committee and on the board of that group, so we have a lot of dialogue with that group. Um, there's a number of local uh, employers that, you know, we have relationships with that we've worked with as city employees, so they know who to call, and I've heard from a number of them, and I continue to hear from a number of them, one of them being Rockline and the other one being NEMAC. So, I mean, that, that dialogue and that relationship is there. Um, I, I think, could it 
could it be more? Yes, you know, and I think to addressing Alderman Boren's comments is I think that's where, you know, we need to really kind of push the EDC to have these dialogues that if the employers aren't willing to raise their, you know, their wages, then maybe they need to contribute to a housing fund to help uh, bridge the gap so we can build more affordable housing at levels that people can afford to live. So I think this is about a public-private partnership versus a strictly a public partnership of trying to get this done. We need our major employers at the table and, and contributing and helping kind of fill this gap and developing you know, something similar to the Dane County Workforce Fund. I just wanted to jump in real quickly um, just to kind of expand on it. As, a, as Chad had said, you know, we are members of the SCEDC, but I, I want to point out the fact that part of the reason why we're having this committee at a whole meeting is to find out what the pulse and direction is. Um, as Mayor Sorensen said, the council is the one that is pretty much what I, what I would call the compass for the for the for the directors for the department heads for for the mayor for myself to actually you know row the boat in that direction what we need from the committee uh, the council okay. is do we do we agree that we should be looking at development not just as in a manufacturing perspective but as i said a, a housing perspective because that changes a lot of dynamics when you're talking with area businesses because when, when you know, since I've been the city administrator, I've said what? We are open for business. But we think of that and that's manufacturing. We need to say it to developers and say, we are open for business in developing additional housing stock and we're here to help you and you know, with your guidance and support. And that's, that's a big deal because we can't, Chad and I can't and the mayor can't move forward and talk with developers and talk to businesses and say, hey, we're serious. We want to help you fix your problem. You fix the wages. We'll fix the housing. We'll fix, you know, you know, when we talk about development, it's not just bringing business here, but it's fixing the problem of having employees here to hire. And I think that's it. We talk about this and it's kind of a circle or a chicken versus the egg, which comes first. And I think we've been talking about this for a long time. And that's why we're here at Committee at a Whole is to say, do we have your support as a council and a, and a Committee at a Whole that that's the direction that we want to move? Then that allows directors and the mayor and myself and Chad and the team to move forward working with the SCEDC and saying our directive is to fix this problem and we're going to do everything we can moving forward. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Just, I just want to kind of add, add to older, older woman Perella's comments too. Um, Chad and I are on the executive board of uh, the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation, and, and my first meeting is uh, this week. So um, this is, I mean, I, I can make a promise to you and the other elders that this is going to be an issue that I definitely bring up with the group, and I'll be hammering home. Um, and then, um, I believe next week or week after that, Todd and I have. Um, uh, heads of have heads of local government meeting with the county, so all the town boards, village presidents across the community, um, and, and, and we'll be presenting some key points from from this study to that as well, just so we can elevate it. So it's not just Sheboygan, uh, the city of Sheboygan carrying the water on this, so that you know the village of Glenbula, the, the town of Russell, you know everyone else kind of plays their part, if you will, um, to really you know finding out what we can do in our corner of the world. Um, to, to have a regional approach. Because we talk a lot about a lot of these jobs in the, the, the communities. You know, yes, Sheboygan plays a huge role. We're the largest municipality in the county. But, you know, when, when Sheboygan's successful, all the other municipalities are successful as well. Um, but, again, bringing it back to the point Alder Woman Perella made, too, just having these conversations with some of the heads of, 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 of our local businesses. Um, yes, we're going to start kicking them off. Yes, we're going to kind of put some more gasoline on the fire, if you will, to kind of light, light a fire underneath folks so that they have some more um, understanding about what our needs are as a community. Um, I've had conversations with, with some of the leadership from the Chamber of Commerce as well. Um, so I think we're laying the groundwork to really really have some more serious conversations about this. And, and this study does help, definitely help provide a lot more meat and potatoes to our conversations and to, um, to the points that we're trying to make as well. So, But I guess, 
kind of to Administrator Wolf's point too, you know, I mean, I, I don't know, I mean, this is Committee of the Whole, so we're a little more casual, if you will, but, um, you know, do we want to go down the line and just kind of, you know, what are folks thinking? Should we create a committee? Should we not? Um, how big should the committee be? Do we want a core five people group? Do we want to have the 30 people housing coalition, you know, do nothing at all? I hope that's not an option around people's minds, but just, you know, kind of what folks' priorities are, what, what, what are you thinking? Because when folks are calling Todd, myself, or Chad, you know, we could each say something different. Um, but we want to make sure that, you know, we kind of have a, a clear, concise vision and we're all moving forward together as the city of Sheboygan, um, you know, on, on a big issue like this. So just wanted to put that out there. Okay. I'm just going to quick, while, while, you, while I got you out, I want to ask you, um, do you think that uh, that, that co coalition is capable of, of, of coming up with a, like a small core group that would work better? I mean, because I think reinventing the wheel, starting with a whole new committee is a lot more challenging, I think. So do you want my personal or professional opinion on this one? Both. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the right one. The right one. <laughs> I, I guess, I guess my, my, my initial conversation is I don't know. I think that, again, we would have to pro provide them with what our priorities are as a city. And a lot of folks that are, I mean, it's the Sheboygan County Housing Coalition too, so this is another component that we have to think about, are the, 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 the stakeholders that are on that table. You know, Generations, for example, is, is one of the, 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 the members on this commission, or that, the, the Housing Coalition, you know, they're in Plymouth. You know, there's some other nonprofit agencies. Well, they're very good, you know, not in the city of Sheboygan. So who's, you know, who has the skin in the game, if you will, about how they're contributing to these conversations. I think myself or Chad or Todd would have to kind of identify, you know, who do we want as kind of the core group? You know, what are some of these components? Do we want a realtor? Do we want a nonprofit agency? Which nonprofit agency? Which realtors? Which landlord? You know, so we need to have, again, you know, a clear focus of, of what this looks like and then, um, then we'll have a better approach. So I guess, mission. Exactly. So I guess the answer to your question, Alder Decker, is it depends um, on, on what, what, what everyone's thinking. So there's your non-answer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Did a good job. Um, yeah. <laughs> just a real, just a real quick comment on, so, you know, the other thing to keep in mind, and I, we could do a pros and cons and we could talk about it. The other thing to keep in mind is open meeting laws yep. and talking mm -hmm. about things and publishing agendas and having it open and trying to talk about development that might be coming, but not telling them what's coming. And, you know, it gets into all of that stuff. So you've got that whole level to deal with if it's a city committee versus a nonprofit. The other piece I think that's, you know, that's out there is the idea that, um, you know, could we pull them out? Yes, you know, I think there's, there's some opportunity, but we're gonna have challenges finding an affordable housing developer that's a city resident to sit on a city committee. Yeah. Because we don't have any. Besides Bob Warner, if and he's a single family housing developer. So, you know, so if we're gonna be looking for <coughs> appointments to that committee, you know, if we want the people that are in the trenches doing this every day to give us some guidance, we're gonna have to give an exception to have outside people on the committee because we're not gonna find them in the city limits. Okay, I think we'll go down the line. Um, we'll go to Berta. Um, okay, no, a, no a couple of things. Um, Todd, you, you, you have repeated a couple of times, you know, is, is housing something that's economic development? In my years of doing economic development, I have never separated the two. It's been who's been at the table. So I, I, don't, see, I don't see the bifurcation of those two things. And I would think moving forward, economic development is economic development. I mean, the RDA has, has, has worked with several of those, of those um, apartments because we know we need apartments. So I don't, I don't think that's an issue that moving forward is that significant. The other thing to think creatively about, and I do agree with what Chad said, um, we, we can't, yes, we are the city, but our employers 
many of our employers are not in the city. So just kind of think bigger than just the city. And when you need city decisions, you get to another venue. Um, the other thing, and I, I think she was from Buffalo, New York, Chad. We heard, um, it was several years ago, but the ability to refurbish existing housing and she did it, did it significantly, and she did it inexpensively, and she did it well. So there's more than one model. We, we don't need empty space and, and build 18 new units. We can take our oftentimes lovely housing stock and make sure that it's healthy and safe. So um, I, I just, there's a piece of me that says, of course we should do all this. Let's just start doing it and, mm -hmm. and not spend all the time thinking about starting doing it. Just start doing it. Thank you. Okay. Marcus. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I wanted to add on a few of the comments that uh, city, uh, you're the administrator now. I almost called you an older person, uh, <laughs> Mr. Wolf. Uh, <laughs> It happens. So what you've been talking about is a very clinical way to talk about this. And I wanted to kind of give you a little bit more uh, in the trenches, uh, give it a human face or, or so, so you get mine. Um, a couple weeks ago, I submitted five offers uh, for five different families, one of which was for a condo, four for single family homes. The lowest offer was $10,000 over asking. The highest offer was $30,000 over asking. Um, all of them got rejected. And it's just because we have no housing stock in our area. Um, over the past few weeks, I've got four out of the five into homes, or at least under contract, so you know, I'm doing my job. But uh, <laughs> we, we have a hard time getting people homes here right now. And it, it, on the ground, there's people searching every day. Home prices are appreciating astronomically. Um, and over the past two months, I've seen people just drop inspections entirely, buying the house so they could get a place to live. To Roberta's point, we're missing the middle housing as well. So there's a lot of buildings that aren't single family homes or high rises, all the stuff in the middle. And we don't have enough of that in Sheboygan. And what we do have isn't housing yet. It's, it's buildings that we can turn into housing. Uh, it's the factories that were uh, no longer operating and are just kind of sitting out there, the warehouses, and it'd be perfect housing stock right on the river or wherever it may be inside the city limits. I'd love to see that going. Uh, when it comes to this committee, uh, or what we're going to do to create it, I think we should have something that's um, almost a subcommittee of our council that can give direction and bring in the experts when needed. Sounds like a good idea. So anyone else have any comments here to answer to that? <laughs> so just to, uh, just to wrap it up, so at the end we had a conversation with the, with the mayor and with all, uh, city administrator Wolf today about this and at the end of the conversation, the mayor asked me, well, what is, what is, your, what is your thoughts on this and what is your goal you know, internally on, on this? And I think, you know, aside from the housing committee and all the specifics with that, I think the piece that makes the most sense, and we didn't really talk about the types of housing, but to what uh, Alderman Sabalio just said is, you know, if we could develop some senior housing um, and I don't, you know, I don't know how that costs us, but that would get us, that would get the people that have moved out of their single family are in apartments, out of those apartments and into, hopefully into a, sing, into a senior housing development. And then people that are contemplating, where do I go? I'm getting old. I can't stay in my single family house and maintain it anymore, would give them another option as well. And when I look at developing a livable community, um, you know, the senior housing piece is frankly a piece of the puzzle that we have not developed. So I think we need to be aggressive in putting together a 55 and older senior housing development um, as really our first phase of, of this and then you know kind of see where everything falls into place after that. Sure. Go, go ahead. Chad, uh, so we've got that 55 plus development. I think it's the landmark square Maybe it's multicolored down by the river and the lake. Those front. are condos, yes. So those are how. So what would you envision that needs to go if not that? Because I don't see that being the solution. This would be a this would be a low income project similar to the Washington School renovation or the 
um, Badger State lost where they would go for some kind of tax credit or some kind of alternate funding and it would be uh, rents based on income. So, um, so that the, you know, the person that's living in the house that they bought when they got married, you know, 35 years, 40 years ago, and they have very limited income could go into one of these units based on their income and it would be a sliding scale of what they pay for rent. Thank you, and one follow-up to that. There is a 55 and up community on Eisner Avenue. Is that the same thing or different? That and if so, how? I think it's, it's senior housing, but it's not based on your income. It's just a standard rate for the rents. So this would be this would be geared towards you had to be 55 and older and you and they would look at your income and based on what you report on your taxes is how they would structure your monthly rents so that you can afford to live there. Thank you. Alrighty, um, I guess one comment that I want to make is is just that the study itself is is tells us what we what we need we need housing um, and my gut tells me I mean just the fact that. The housing that we, we, the apartments that have been put up have been filled as fast as they've been put up. I mean, uh, when, when, uh, when constituents have, had said something to me about, you know, why are they putting up so many, why are they putting all these apartments up? I, these developers are developing these apartments because there's a need for them. They're, they're being filled. So, I mean, when constituents complain about that, that's one of the things that I always, I said, you know, these, these developers aren't spending this money just to spend this money to build these. So the, the, the need is there, and I think we have to do whatever we can to whatever we, to support that, so. So I think, you know, it, really what I think the, t the takeaways are is that if you guys agree that there is a need for housing is the fact that, you know, the city staff is gonna be aggressive in looking at, you know, marketable sites that we think bode themselves well for for housing, whether it's single family or multifamily, and that the city's gonna have to be prepared to buy some of these properties and you know find the money at some stage to to do so. Um, and likewise, you know, if we get a development that we're gonna have to be committed to some kind of TIF incentive if it's if it's an affordable housing uh, project, because um, you know, you can see the numbers. They're not the numbers aren't gonna lie. It's it's you know, thirteen hundred plus to build a unit. So we're gonna need your support as we move forward in this journey. Alrighty, anyone else have comments? Okay. Uh, Alderman Decker, this is Alderman Bourne. I had a question for Chad. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Chad, uh, have you, uh, do you have any information on the demographics of who's moving into these apartments? Uh, uh, and then, you know, if it's the senior citizens that are downsizing and moving into an apartment, what's happening to their houses? Maybe markets could answer that. But what, you know, what, what's happening with these apartments? Who's renting them? The majority of the apartments, I would say it's probably 50-50 young professionals to empty nesters. So it's people that have identified the, fa the empty nesters are people that their kids have moved out and they said, why do I have a 3,000 square foot home for just us? And they're selling their houses and you know those houses then are going on the market and as fast as they're going on the market, they're sold. Um, but the other ones are people that are coming in for jobs from the outside that are you know going to work at our major employers. So. You know, when I've talked to these housing uh, developers and said, you know, what is your mix? Um, most of them are 50-50. Portscape Apartments on South Pier is probably leans closer to 70-30. So 70% empty nesters, 30% young professional. But the rest of them uh, along A Street and in the core of the downtown are probably 50-50. Thank you. So do we need any other discussion on this? Do we have anything that, you know, uh, do we, is there anything that we want to put forward as far as a motion or anything like that? As far as, um... Well, I think, you know, we, to the mayor's point, you know, we at some stage are going to have to decide if we're going to have a committee or not and whether we want to support that recommendation. We don't have to do nothing at yeah. this point, but you know, if, if there is a recommendation for a committee or if the, if the recommendation is to work with the housing coalition and see if we can get there, um, we can you know, call some of their leaders in and have a meeting with them and see what their interest is and report back at a future committee of the whole. You know, this, it's up to you guys. Okay. Uh, 
Alderperson Perella. So I just want to confirm that um, I agree that the, so I, I, I don't think that the committee is a, a good solution, except if, in my opinion, if we use it, we create it to, with, with the foc exclusively with the focus of um, relating to local employers. So if we want to use a committee as a tool to become aggressive as representatives of the city of Sheboygan with the employers, then that fo I would be interested in developing that focus. Having a committee that we don't know really what is the value that it would have, what's the mission and so on, I, I wouldn't agree with that. And as far as uh, the idea of supporting housing development, I actually um, watched the study with you guys online and uh, I agree that the results were very clear about the need of housing in Sheboygan. Administrator Wolf. Thank you, Chair. I, I would like to just make a suggestion to the, to the committee of the whole group um, that if it's, if it, if the spirit is in the right direction that you guys would agree to this and it's basically giving the mayor, myself and Chad uh, direction that we would, that you would like us to come back at a future meeting, council meeting and give a presentation. The reason I'm saying that we could make some recommendations. We have several meetings as the mayor had pointed out coming up, uh, whether it's the SCEDC or the, uh, um, the local heads of state um, for, this, for our, our uh, county. Um, but we can, during these meetings, we can reach out to local businesses as part of the SEEDC, uh, the local heads, the county, and we can kind of get um, a litmus test of the, the feeling of what they see and hear and kind of bring that back to you guys with some recommendations on next steps, whether it's how we're gonna develop the committee um, internally, externally, and what some of the maybe mission statements w could be for you guys to, to ponder and, and decide and give us uh, f a further definition and direction. Mr. Chairman, this is Alderman Boren. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, I, like, I like Todd's idea and I think uh, when you're talking to the SDEDC members, Todd, and, and, and other businesses, uh, one, of the, one of the things, and you probably remember this from when you were in the private sector, it's not a matter of just getting bodies for jobs, it's qualified people for these jobs. And I think the SDEDC and, and the other companies around Sheboygan Co County, and I know they're doing this, but they're gonna have to re redouble their efforts all the way down to the high school level and let it be known at the high school level what courses the students are going to need to take in math and science to qualify for these jobs, these future jobs. And also, the guidance counselors at these high schools uh, have to realize that all of the students don't have to go to the UW system in order to get a new job. If you get out of the UW system or some other college, uh, with, a, with a BA and X and it pays 35 or $40,000 a year and you've got $30,000 in student debt, it's not gonna work. They've gotta point out that there's jobs available in the trades that are paying 60, 70, $80,000 after apprenticeships with Cadillac benefit packages and no student loans. Those, our, our employers have to let the, the LTC, and I know they're working on this, and all the way down to the high schools, but they're gonna to have to redouble their efforts. And that's gonna that's gonna bring up that per capita income over the next five to 10 years. And then when we're talking to companies that are gonna to move to Sheboygan, we can tell them that we've got the students taking the right courses that are gonna be are, are gonna make qualified employees, not just bodies. All right, thank you, Jim. Okay, well. I would say that um, what Todd said with the, uh, his recommendation, uh, um, I think that that's the f a first start. And I think that's just, just the start. Um, and uh, I think that's where we, where we should go is, is, is give them direction, Todd and Chad and Ryan and have them 
work through this and uh, come back to us with some with a, an idea as to what, the, what, what a plan. Um, I don't know what it, anything else. Is. Just that. <laughs> <laughs> a plan. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we really do. Do we need a motion for this? Really? No. We just is just a. This is just a. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you can do a voice vote. Just to okay. All right. We have that. Uh, Marcus is a first, and we and Betty's got a second. Uh, are all those uh, um, any other discussion on that? All those in favor of that? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, that carries. All right. Seeing as we've exhausted the agenda, motion to adjourn. Motion, to adjourn. Aye. motion made and seconded. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Good job. Thanks. Thanks.